Hello and welcome back to the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory. My name is Dr. Roger Green. This is another lecture video in our Introduction to Critical Theory course. Uh, we recently, the previous readings were uh, from Carl Schmitt from his 1922 book, Political Theology. Remember, I was fr I'm was i framing the context for the emergence of the Frankfurt School or the School for um, so the Institute for social research, um, which gives birth to the idea of critical theory. So this is about contextualizing the historical moment for the er early critical theorists. We went to the right with Carl Schmitt um, in previous lectures, and now we are heading towards the left, and um, we're going to be dealing with Vladimir Lenin um, and the Russian Revolution um, between uh, 1917 and 1922 that produces the Soviet Union in 1922. Uh, so let me just share my screen here with my notes. Uh, and I'm going to dig in. Um, we'll get some contextualizing along the way here. Um, I don't start out with, with uh, his uh, historical situation, but we get a little bit in to that when I uh, get into to chapter two. So I'm just gonna cover chapters one and two of Lenin's State and Revolution in this particular lecture, and then we'll do another um, lecture video because um, my notes are already getting kind of long. So let us begin. Lenin's 1917 introduction to State and Revolution um, uh, notes that the state is where theory meets practice during his time, especially the relationship that the emergent proletarian class will have with the state. So socialist chauvinism, according to Lenin, is on the rise, seeking to adapt Marxian ideas to nationalist communities, right? At the end of the manifesto, it's workers of the world unite, supposed to be international. So the tr any kind of trend towards nationalism, like the fascism that's arising in Italy around this uh, 1922 as well, any of those trends are going to be non-Marxian from Lenin's perspective, right? Um, <clears throat> so the imperialist bourgeoisie, according to Lenin, uses the state to um, to do this, um, to, you know, dilute Marxism, um, giving birth to the, necess the necessity for the proletarian masses to analyze the state itself. A proletarian socialist revolution, according to Lenin here, needs to elucidate um, to the masses its relationship to the state. So this book is a kind of polemics, right? It's a, it's a book that's trying to teach the masses why it's necessary to understand what the state is at this particular moment in time. So Lenin opens chapter one with an analysis of the state, quote, as the product of the irreconcilability of class antagonisms, end quote. Marx's doctrine, like other revolutionaries' teachings, has lost its revolutionary edge because a new generation of moderates have accepted it in watered-down form and merely offered mediocre efforts to address the changes for which his original philosophy called. This is an emasculating or a vulgarizing of the original doctrine's essence, according to Lenin. The bourgeoisie and, quote, opportunists within the labor movement are at fault here. Quote, they omit, obliterate, and distort the revolutionary side of its teaching, its revolutionary soul, end quote. This has particularly been the case, Lenin says, in Germany, where socialists ha have tended to nationalize Marx. And we'll come back to why that's such a big deal for him and why, why he's got a an axe to grind against um, Kotsky and, and the German democratic socialists. Um, but here he's saying that, that, that there's been this tendency to nationalize Marx. And maybe that's partly to claim the Marx as a German philosopher too, even though Marx was mostly not able to work in Germany. Um, uh, so it's Lenin's task here and to quote, resuscitate the real teachings of Marx on the state. Uh, end quote. So he will have to draw on long quotations from Marx and Engels, he says, in order to do this. So he's setting us up 
uh, himself up to be the person who is the great interpreter of Marx and Engels for the masses. An analysis of Marx and Engels, according to Lenin, shows that the state is not a power imposed from some elsewhere onto society onto society, but that it arises historically to mediate a class conflict between the bourgeoisie and lower classes. It is neither a moral idea nor a, quote, image of reason, as Hegel and idealism had claimed. It is the product or real relations between people at a certain stage in history. The state arises as a power above conflicting classes, quote, the state arises where, when, where, and to the extent that class antagonisms cannot be objectively reconciled. And conversely, the existence of the state proves that class antagonisms are reconcilable, end quote. This is a contradiction. Um, uh, uh, this makes two main distortions, um, according to Lenin, in classic Marxism. First, he says, the petty bourgeois who have accepted that Marx was basically right with respect to the historical emergence of the state through class antagonism, try to correct Marx by viewing the state as an organ to reconcile class antagonism. But according to Lenin, Marx viewed the state as a, quote, organ of class domination. Its purpose, its entire purpose, is to legitimate oppression not reconcile the class division. The petty bourgeoisie, Lenin says, conflates order with reconciliation. This is essentially what has arisen in current the current Re Russian revolution in the context in which he's writing, where socialist revolutionaries and Mensheviks, quote, sank to the petty bourgeois theory, while the Bolsheviks, which is, of course, Lenin's own party, maintained a revolutionary position. The second distortion that Lenin says um, erupts um, uh, during these conditions, the second distortion of Marx stems from what he says calls Kotskyism, after Karl Kotsky of the German Social Democratic Party. Kotskyism, according to Lenin, forgets that if the state really is a force above society and that it is, quote, increasingly separating itself from all of it, then it must not only be overthrown through violent revolution, but also without destruction of the apparatus of state power. Um, so then this is an interesting sort of moment of this text that like we have with the, uh, the rise of the state apparatus, according to Lenin, um, uh, he will say the centralization of state power increasingly after the French Revolution. Um, and so this is where we get something kind of new and something that he says that the social Democrats miss is that there is um, uh, a, an entire apparatus of state power. Um, he says that this arises in section two here um, with uh, um, uh, after the French Revolution with the idea of the nation state, we get um, special bodies of armed men, we get prisons, etc. And some of us might think about like why a thinker, a later thinker like Michel Foucault would then go in and spend so much time trying to describe the history of prisons and the prison system. What he is essentially doing at that point in time is, is giving a further analysis to this kind of trajectory and thinking. Yes, I know that, of course, um, in current discourse about Michel Foucault, um, he seems to have fallen under the same charge as the later critical theorists that 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 he's really in support of liberal democracy, right? And that that's what gives him his rise to power. That's what the current discourse in critical theory is saying about Foucault. But this is what makes Foucault seem very leftist when he first um, uh, describes um, uh, the birth of the prison and, and things like that. Um, drawing on Ingalls, then, in this next section, um, Lenin, um, dr Lenin draws on Ingalls' articulation of the historical rise of state power. Um, he points to a particular notion of power corrupted by special bodies of armed men. Again, think about Foucault's 
um, if you know Foucault's work, think about the way that he develops power knowledge, right? There's a lot of richness here in understanding um, what, what Foucault means there um, by, by looking at this particular moment in history. In the historical formation, according to Ingalls, um, those armed bodies are not identical with the state, at least not to start, but perception over time, the, um, the, the development of prisons and armies, et cetera, makes this seem to be the case. Lenin says, because the European audience is being addressed by Ingalls and Marx in the 19th century had not themselves experienced armed revolution, um, they could not grasp the idea um, that some of the groups are, quote, self-acting organizations of the population. Now, there is the 1948 revolutions, and then there is the 1871 Paris Commune. So there are isolated moments, I think, that Lenin is saying where Europeans might understand this, but they don't understand it on a mass scale in the 19th century, according to Lenin. So while at one point in history, um, Lenin says that 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 it might have been an organic thing to to witness the kind of coalescence of an armed um, group of people. Um, uh, uh, the development of the state in its present state, like um, standing armies and the and the police, um, are intimately uh, linked to the state, which specifically arose to dominate oppressed groups of people and maintain order. So there may have been a time in history where um, organic groups of people coalesced together to take charge of something. But at this point in history, um, the state apparatus has developed a way to control standing armies to put people in prison and, and um, control groups and masses of people in that uh, through oppression and force. Um, so the armies and the police are intimately linked to the state, which specifically arose to dominate the groups and maintain order. He says the American and French revolutions show that there was a possibility, perhaps for organically derived groups of armed men to have a short window before class antagonisms give birth to the state and imperial desires. So yes, maybe we had these revolutions in the late 1700s um, where we had militia groups um, arising, um, but very quickly as those nations grow in populace and power, we get the class antagonisms that produce the state. Within the state, then, uh, Lenin says, a standing army or police force requires taxes and state loans in order to keep existing. So state officials are tax tasked with acquiring these funds, and the army and police then depend on the funds. This ultimately alienates the would-be organic organization by creating separate professional classes of warrior and bureaucrat. A tribal leader, um, uh, at this point, and Lenin says, a tribal leader might enjoy more respect from his people while a shabby policeman uh, wields authority over his would-be clansmen. Kotsky in Germany and those like him in the late 19th century represent attempts to smooth over organic yet ultimately ineffective attempts at revolution, such as Germany um, in 1848, or France in 1848 as well, um, but um, more recently, the longer standoff um, of the 1871 Paris Commune, um, which gave way with the rise of the German Empire, right? So like, you know, the dissolving of the Paris Commune, there's this other war going on, the Prussian-Franco War, and that produces the coalescence of the German Empire, right? Or uh, in the late 19th century under Otto von Bismarck. So the German empire at this point contained multiple states and Carl Schmidt talked about this in um, his recent book that we read. Um, all of the states um, had localized power, but Schmidt was complaining about whether or not um, they actually had sovereignty, if you remember from my earlier lectures. Um, Kerensky in Russia, who was the... Um, the leader of the provisional government in the 1917 um, revolution uh, represents for Len Lenin here, the lineage of Kotskyism that tried to smooth over class antagonism with certain concessions um, that tried to use the state as a reconciliation organ instead of an oppression organ 
Democratic republics, according to Lenin, result in corrupt officials, and the alliance of the government with the stock market, as has happened in his time in France and America. Thus, the democratic republic for Lenin is just a shell, a preservation of bourgeois, quote, wealth that works in concert with imperialism to constantly expand control and dominate the world. Universal suffrage or voting rights purports to be emancipatory, but it really ends up in preserving an ideology whereby the lower classes, because they have the right to vote, apparently choose their own oppression, while petty bourgeois state officials run the show to preserve their own wealth um, while taxing the working class to then pay for the police and the standing armies, armies that oppress them. This is an illusion, according to Lenin, masking as the general will of the people, to use Rousseau's term, right? Uh, citing Ingalls, then, Lenin notes that the state is simply the mark of an historical age, a stage, a stage in history, right? The state is, is, is a temporary societal organization, according to Marx and Ingalls and Lenin here. Um, it marks... Um, uh, uh, the, a, a particular moment that through class conflict will inevitably disappear or exist, quote, in the famous phrase here, in the Museum of Antiquities side by side with the spinning wheel and the bronze axe, end quote. It's a quote from Ingalls. Lenin then turns in the next section to a closer analysis of this famous passage of Ingalls. Um, where he claims that the state is not abolished, but, quote, withers away. This doctrine differs from that of the anarchists who call for the immediate abolition of the state overnight. However, those opposed to full revolution have taken it as a way to dilute the revolutionary impulse, so it is necessary for Lenin here to stress that Ingalls says the proletarian revolution quote, puts an end to the state immediately, what's left are its apparatuses, but the most important being that its special repressive force, which Lenin says shifts from being a weapon of the bourgeois to that of the proletarians, thus marking the destruction of the state as the state. So the anarchists want this immediate obliteration of all of the state and all of its apparatuses, whereas what uh, Lenin is saying is that that no, what is going to happen is um, the proletarian uh, revolution, and there will be this intermediary period where the that the dict the dictatorship of the proletariat masses um, will use the apparatuses of the state um, as its own weapons to solidify the revolution itself. Right, so it's just a doctrinal difference between. Um, the communists and the anarchists here. Um, so Lenin says that there's a confusion that's developed, uh, that has been developed related to the concept of democracy, which Ingalls introduces alongside this idea of the withering away of the state. Lenin sees this as a brief and true democracy in which the the the, the real the because the masses of the proletariat are the but by by far the 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 most the, the largest population in human society, that that is a brief and true democracy. Um, but that that democracy, of course, dissipates with the state itself. Um, Lenin then claims that social democrats in the 1870s in Germany took this as a way to preserve a bourgeois democracy, and that's where they forget or they dilute um, uh, real Marxism. So Lenin then qualifies this. He says, quote, we are in favor of a democratic republic as the best form of the state for the proletariat under capitalism, but we have no right to forget that wage slavery is the lot of the people, even in the most democratic bourgeois republic. Consequently, no state is either free or a people's state, because a state is always an oppressive organ of the bourgeoisie for um, Marx, Engels, and Lenin. Shifting to chapter two then, um, he wants to return back to that uh, the French Revolution in particular of 1848 to, to the 1851 period. Um, the, 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 um, 
uh, the period when when um, second Nepo or Napoleon the third comes into to to power, um, and what uh, Marx in another uh, piece of writing calls a farce, um, but that's a different uh, that's a different text. Lenin notes that the dictatorship of the proletariat became a term for Marx and Engels only following the Paris Commune in 1871. So it doesn't show up in the Communist Manifesto, which is written just before the outbreak of these revolutions in 1848. Um, so he, Lenin says that the dictatorship of the proletariat becomes one of in Marx and Engels' most important ideas here. He notes that Marx and Engels had to develop their thought as new occurrences evolved. They had to experience these revolutions. They had to live through them in order to really see how all of this stuff works. So thus the full formation of thought is not in the communist manifesto, according to Lenin. Lenin's technique here reads a combination of published and unpublished writings by Marx and Engels, including personal letters. One gets a sense that Lenin is doing a massive amount of synthesizing here, and all of the accounts of Lenin during this period are that he's just studying and writing, studying and reading and writing all of the time, all of the time developing the ideas that go into the books like uh, State and Revolution here. So here it helps to understand a bit concerning the conditions in which Lenin composed state and revolution. Lenin's vitriol, his hatred of the social democrats in Germany, had to do with their support for the German empire against the Russian empire in World War I, which of course breaks out around 1914, right? But according to an agreement made by the Second International in Stuttgart, um, German, um, German, sometimes it's in Germany, sometimes it's in France, right? Depending on which wars, which period we're in. Uh, but there's a um, uh, uh, there's a convention in 1907 where socialists, about nine, oh, close to 900 of them around the world, um, agreed that they would not support the wars, of, that they would not support empires. So when World War I later breaks out, the social democrats in Germany side with support of Germany as, as a kind of imperial or nation state against the front, the Russian empire, right? And, and because of that alliance, um, uh, Vladimir Lenin thinks that the social democrats have turned their backs on um, the endeavor towards, um, uh, towards a Marxian revolution. And that, and because of that hypocrisy, I think that's where we get um, such a like the vehemence and the kind of hatred that 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 you feel coming off of Lenin in this text. Um, so, moreover, Lenin had just composed during this time period in 1917 um, the, a book called "Imperialism: The Highest Stage of Capitalism," which would be published in September of 1917. But he's been working. He this is what he's been writing almost at the same time as State and Revolution. So Lenin saw in that book and argued that imperialism is the result of monopoly capitalism. So if you are supporting imperialist endeavors, you're ultimately supporting monop monopoly capitalism. Um, and and that, that that's the enemy of the Marxian or the communist revolution. In Russia, during the February of 1917, a workers' revolt in Petrograd, the largest industrial city um, in Russia, broke out. It's important that it's industrial here, right? Because Marx had originally said that the only way we're going to get a revolution is through industrialized capitalism, through um, an advanced stage of capitalism, right? Um, and this is going to be something that the, the critical theorists are trying to analyze um, closely, that the idea of the, that a uh, communist revolution would not happen in Russia is because, by and large, Russia, the Russian Empire at this particular moment in, in history, is not industrialized, not nearly as industrialized as Germany, for example. However, the fact that um, Petrograd is an industrialized city in Russia, I think, is 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 really pertinent to why Lenin believes that this is going to be the, the moment for the revolution. So in February of 1917, this workers' revolt in Petrograd breaks out. 
The unrest spreads throughout Russia and the Tsar at the time, Nicholas II, abdicates power. This was the dissolution of the Russian Empire and it established a provisional government of the Russian Republic. It's a very short-lived republic in 1917. Lenin at the time had been living in Switzerland, exiled due to his op opposition to the Tsar. Because Russia was still at war with Germany, Lenin was able to make a deal with the Germans to smuggle him by train back to Petrograd. It was in the interest of Germans at this point in time. They're, they're not supporters of Lenin's cause necessarily because they're just imperialists too. But it was in their, the interest of the Germans to help the revolutionary Lenin in hopes that the unrest that he would inspire in Russia would alleviate the conditions on the Eastern Front um, during because World War I is still going on at this particular moment, right? So when Lenin famously arrived at Finland Station in Petrograd in 1917, he excoriate. He comes out. He gives the speech. He excoriates um, the Russian socialists and the Mensheviks, making room for his own Bolshevik party's voice in the provisional government. Unrest during the following months sent him into hiding and sometimes out of the country. Alexander Kerensky, again, who was the leader of the provisional government um, during this period, um, made more room for Bolsheviks um, because he. Um, and the other kind of uh, 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 social, um, the, the socialists and the Mensheviks um, are worried um, um, that the czarist forces are going to have a counter revolution. And the Bolsheviks have always claimed that they what we need to have is an armed takeover. So the Bolsheviks, because of their willingness to be violent and to engage in violence, become uh, for Kerensky, a possibility to um, help stave off um, the the retakeover by czarist or imperialist forces at the time. So they make um, uh, the more moderate social, socialist revolutionaries and the Mensheviks lost support during this particular moment. This is all kind of, kind of the summer of 1917. Um, uh, and then uh, Leon Trotsky is elected to Petrograd as Petrograd Soviet in September of 1917. And because he's a Bolshevik as well, um, this allows Lenin to return to Petrograd in October. And thus we get the October Revolution in 1917, which brought the Bolsheviks to dominance because they were more willing to have direct um, uh, uh, armed revolt against um, uh, the, the, the quickly dissipating imperialists or the czarists. Um, supporters. Um, Lenin had spent much of 1916 reading the philosophers who had influenced Marx, namely Hegel, Feuerbach, and Aristotle. He became increasingly convinced during this period that Marxian ideas needed to move from theory into practice. And this increased his belief that army, an armed revolt was the only way and so you can see easily see that he's developing this argument in State and Revolution to explain to the masses why the armed revolt, why the Bolshevik revolution is particularly necessary. So again, the fact that a provisional state was already in existence adds support to his thinking here. So as he says, quote, the toilers need the state only to overcome the resistance of the exploiters, and the proletariat can direct this suppression and bring it to fulfillment, for the proletariat is the only class that is thoroughly revolutionary, the only class that can unite all the toilers and the exploited in the struggle against the bourgeoisie and completely displacing it. So Lenin is at pains here to stress the workers' revolt because he needs to obliterate reformist opposition in the struggle against the imperialists. He argues uh, that the 1848 and 1871 revolts, as well as the French and Revolution and Napoleon the first here, um, ended up in solidifying, solidifying a more centralized idea of the state. Um, the more centralized the idea the state apparatus becomes, the more quickly the revolution can overturn it. The proletariat then must become a temporary ruling class. Quote, 
The proletariat needs state power, the centralized organization of force, the organization of violence, both for the purpose of crushing the resistance of the exploiters and for the purpose of guiding the great mass of the population, the peasantry, the petty bourgeoisie, the semi-proletarians, in the work of, of organizing socialist economy. Um, so this is, um, he doesn't use the term here, but just remember again, as I've said in earlier lectures, that Marx and Engels also have this idea of the lumpen proletariat. They're kind of more like the peasantry, like um, peasantry are not necessarily the proletarian working classes. The proletarians are the ones who've gone and worked in factories. They've had their specialized labor. They've been alienated from their labor um, with connection to the land. And so they end up being a kind of intermediary for the peasants. They need to teach the peasants um, why this revolution is necessary to overthrow their oppressors. So a crucial aspect related to the development of critical theory arises here. Always at stake here, is how to educate people. Most people are not interested in critical theory, right? <laughs> there are people, those of you out on the internet who are watching this sort of stuff, who are interested in this sort of stuff, but most people are not. Um, it's difficult reading and it requires commitment. It requires intellectual thought. It requires literacy, which a lot of Russian peasants did not have. Um, as always, there's a need to translate ideas, and this always risks a kind of elitism, the charge of elitism, that those of us who are doing critical theory um, are just educated elites um, who are uh, then falling into the corruption and opportunism of uh, um, taking power, that if a revolution happens, then we step in as elites and then... Um, become a new controlling elite rather than having a full revolution, right? So that's a risk of the elitism. Um, Marxism then sets up the task of educating the workers' party here. So like the man of, like we saw in the manifesto, we see the language of a vanguard showing up. Um, and, and Marx uses that as the term that, that what distinguishes a communist um, in the manifesto, if you rem remember back to my earlier lectures. Um, so the people need guides to lead the way, especially against the possibility of opportunism and selfishness to arise for them too, not just for the so-called elites who know this stuff, that 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 in, in any kind of overthrowing of power, um, an individual might seek to try, like in that moment, to acquire wealth or loot things, steal things for their own um uh uh survival and what they need is to learn how this is a mass revolt um that's going to benefit everybody right so the people need guides to lead the way especially against the possibility for opportunism and selfishness to arise lenin returns again to the necessity of the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat by saying that it took marx and engels a long time and experience to see the centralization of the state through this experience, the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat becomes a more concrete idea and less a, le a less theoretical one for them. At this point in the text, similar to Carl Schmitt, who we've recently read, Lenin is giving an account of the 19th century, of the recent history of states, right? And this is an interesting kind of moment of almost intersection between Lenin and Schmitt here. Um, uh, Lenin says, quote, the centralized power peculiar to the bourgeois society came into being in the period of the fall of absolutism. And from this, two institutions are especially characteristic of this state machinery, bureaucracy and the standing army. Now, remember, Schmidt sees in absolutism, in the monarch monarchical absolutism, the necessity for the sovereign, right? the strong sovereign decider. Um, but he complains that liberalism and constitutionalism have created um, a society that where there is no sovereignty anymore. And it seems like Lenin would kind of agree with that here, except that what Lenin sees is that the institutions of the sta state machinery, bureaucracy, and the standing army um, provide the way in for a revolution that will be a, um, the dictatorship of the proletariat. My American students should think at this point in, in, in um, uh, reading the text here, you might want to think about 
um, uh, or ponder the U.S. Con Constitutional Con Convention of the 1780s, where the need for the standing army was argued, um, was it was a point of debate. Um, it was argued on the basis of a perceived threat from American Indians, as the legal scholar Gregory Oblowski has shown. So this is an important legal context, and it's something that's not very often emphasized in American history courses. And I've got Oblowski's article cited here. So if you want to look down at the page, it's the, the, the article is from Duke Law Journal in February 2014. Um, called the Savage Constitution. And what he says is that the reason that the Constitution and the Federalist um, uh, sort of organization of, of the various um, colonies or the states, um, the development of a standing army um, comes because the, the British have been defeated, but the, there is a threat, especially for the weaker colonies towards the West, from Native Americans. And that idea, that perceived threat, at least, is what establishes the standing um, uh, federal army for the United States. An interesting point of con point to think about, and we will come back to some Native um, American critical theorists later on in this course. It's just a point um, that you might think about, that standing armies and the whole idea of a federal standing army is a rather recent um, uh, uh, idea that has arisen with the nation state itself. Yes, of course, there were earlier private armies under um, different princes and stuff. So it's not like there are the art idea of an army only comes um, to into existence, but the idea of a professional army, right? Especially after Napoleon um, as well. So it's remarkable here that Lenin proceeds to describing the events of the very recent months um, uh, in 1917 that lead up to the October Revolution. It's really important, I think, for readers to think about who were more, as we're reading State and Revolution, just to see it like, to, to, that you gotta, you have to notice just how present the conditions were for Lenin. Like he's writing right up to his actual moment in history, even though he's looking back like Schmidt um, towards uh, a historical account of states and um, uh, um, their development over the past 100 or 150 years before him. So readers today ought to note just how present the conditions were for Lenin as he wrote, quote, the practical results of the six months between March 12th and September 9th, 1917, beyond all dispute, are reforms shelved, distribution of officials' births accomplished, and mistakes in distribution corrected by a few reader distributions. That's not enough for him. There has to be a violent revolution, as the Bolshe Bolsheviks are claiming. So toward the end of chapter two, Lenin addresses a potential opposition to his argument. He, he, asks, he asks the question, quote, is it correct to generalize the experience and observations and conclusions of Marx to apply them to a wider field than the history of France during the years of 1848 to 1851, end quote? He then says that since the 1871 Paris Commune, there was a lull on the power of the proletariat in France. At first, it seems really powerful, and then it dissipates, and then we get the rise of the Russian, or sorry, excuse me, of the German Empire. He indicates that while France has been the main site for an analysis of world history, because in France we see the overthrowing of feudalism, we see the development of um, uh, the Industrial Revolution happening, for example, um, he says that the conditions of the late 19th century do not necessitate that the full revolution um, is going to be arising in France. And the reason for this is the combination between capitalism and imperialism that arose in France and England and America at that point. So remember, he's also just written this book about imperialism and um, uh, its connection to capitalism, right? So imperialism at this point in the late 19th century, according to Lenin, imperialism has the role of further centralizing the state but also on a global stage. He's going in a completely different direction than Schmidt here. Um, although Schmidt is seeing, wants imperialism to be the site um, for a continued notion of sovereignty. And that's why he calls the German states um, uh, um, not fully sovereign, right? And there needs to be a decider. Um, Lenin is still talking about the same phenomenon, the, the formation of imperialism, the Russian Empire, the German Empire, 
French Empire, the English Empire. This is the late 19th century moment. Um, and then American aspirations to empire at this point in time, although they're not necessarily as uh, a fully fledged world power at this moment. Um, but there is the the Americans, of course, are, are um, uh, have imperialist tendencies in Hawaii in the late 18th century. They've you know expanded through Western expansion across um, to the West Coast. They've fought against um, their would be anti colonial. Um, uh, a brother uh, or sibling, I guess, um, Mexico in an illegal war against Mexico in 1848 as well, right? If we pop to the United States, we have the war with Mexico and the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo um, that solidifies Western expansion. And so what we can see that Americans, the United States has aspirations to empire, um, but they're not a major a player for Lenin here. Um. Uh, so the whole 19th century moment towards um, empire, em, empire um, expands the theater of Marx and Engels' original pred predictions to allow for a much broader analysis, according to Lenin here. Lenin then turns back to Marx to reemphasize the necessity for the realization of the dictatorship of the proletariat against the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. And that's an important term that he uses because you might say oh I, I live in a liberal democracy and lenin would correct you and say you do not live in a real democracy you live in a place that has the dictatorship of the bourgeoisie which masks itself as democracy he then makes the important distinction that marx himself noted that marx marx said that he did not formulate the idea of class struggle as the movement of history but rather bourgeois theorists pointed to it well before him. What Marx says is that his own innovation was to connect the class struggle to the means of production and the rise of the dictatorship of the proletariat. That connection to the means of production is, of course, historical materialism, which is the main method that Marxist uh, analysts use for, for uh, thinking about history and its movement. So from there, from this point, from pointing to this section in Marx, Lenin comes back to his argument and he goes on to make the, the distinction between the real Marxist and the bourgeois-leaning socialist. He says, quote, to limit Marxism to the teachings of the class struggle means to curtail Marxism, to distort it to something which is acceptable to the bourgeoisie. It's what creates the forgetfulness that he charges Kotsky with, right? Um, a Marxist, rather, is one who extends the acceptance of the class struggle to the acceptance of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Thus, through violent revolution, quote, the state during this period of 1917, right, as he's writing this, the state during this period inevitably must be a state that is democratic in a new way for the proletariat and the poor in general, and dictatorial in a new way against the bourgeoisie. That takes us to the end of chapter two of State and Revolution by Vladimir Lenin. Um, I will continue in a future lecture to cover the rest of um, this relatively short but very dense book. Um, I saw a, a post somewhere online today um, from the late Antonio Negri, who was a big Marxist scholar, who said um, that, that uh, um, State and Revolution by Lenin is is the best introduction to Marxism. I think that that's an interesting thing. It certainly was not my introduction to Marxism. I was introduced to to Marx um, by a Hegelian philosopher. <laughs> so I uh, just thought I would throw that out there. Um, um, uh, um, words from the late Antonio Negri. Um, if you, as always, if you have the means and the ability to support us on Patreon, please feel free to support us. If you're a student taking this for a university course, um, you've already paid for the course, so don't feel like I'm asking for more money from you. Um, we will continue on with our course. Thank you for listening or watching whenever and wherever you are. Have a great night, morning, evening, day, um, and we will catch up with you again soon. Bye.